Hey, everybody. This is a long video, one I've been looking forward to for quite some time with one of my heroes, Michael Saylor. We're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to talk about giving back to Bitcoin, to investing, to the markets, to the Great Reset, and a ton of other material. I know many of you may not have an hour and a half to look at it all, but detailed chapters are below. Hope you like it. Enjoy. Let's go. I'll do a very brief intro. Everybody kind of knows who you are, but let's see how this goes. And I'm very, very excited. So first of all, um, we should be on gallery view. Everybody, I would like to introduce Michael Saylor. This is a man who is very special. Uh, I've been tracking him for nearly 15 years due to some of my history. Mr. Saylor knew what business intelligence was before anybody even knew what it was. He's a visionary MIT grad. He knew mobile was the future again before anybody else knew what it was. And he has this uncanny ability to weave together the best metaphors on earth, in my opinion. He's been the CEO of MicroStrategy since the late 80s. And I've been, again, following him for a long time. In fact, my YouTube channel actually became famous because of MicroStrategy. And I identified what he was doing and felt everyone needs to get their hands on the stock. So the rest is history. And that all happened uh, late 2020. And now we have thousands of viewers that are MicroStrategy shareholders, either in their ISAs in the UK or IRAs in the US or the brokerage accounts all over the world. So big thank you for being here, Mr. Sailor. Happy to be here, James. <laughs> okay, this is going to be an interesting conversation. We're going to go fast. We're going to cover a lot of cool ground. But first of all, I have a little treat for you. And okay. uh, I'm going to share something with you just as a little surprise. As you know, a big part of this channel is really to give back. And I know you are a nautical person to some extent. And we contribute a lot of money we make to back to nature and children's hospitals and stuff. So we adopted a whale. This is the second last one available. We named him Sailor. And <laughs> this, <laughs> this is part of... Uh, uh, the Oceanic Society that helps keep our ocean safe and clean, free from plastic, protect wildlife, and it tracks Sailor, a humpback whale. And Sailor likes to float between the Oregon coast and the Gulf of Mexico, believe it or not, and uh, spends a lot of time hanging out at the Farallon Islands, which is not far from where I am a lot of the time. So Sailor is yours. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you I'm like impressed. that. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> so that's awesome. That's, We'll, we'll jump I might need to track Sailor the Whale. <laughs> exactly. Well, you are a whale yourself. So, Sailor uh, might be hard to keep up with. We'll see. <laughs> exactly. So again, let's uh, jump in. I'll start at the beginning. Um, first of all, I'm not going to talk about adiabatic processes, which I know are near and dear to your heart, but we will talk about your view of the world. So with your book, The Mobile Wave, you nailed the future of technology 10 years ago. D and it was uncanny how you did it. I remember one of the, the key things, you, you equated uh, PCs to uh, a solid, laptops to a liquid, and mobile to a gas. Now, I, that really resonated with me uh, a decade ago, and I thought, wow, the future is mobile, the future is search, et cetera. But do you believe you have nailed the next big thing, as in Bitcoin? Like you were really the first to spot the mobile well, wave. Well, you think Bitcoin is the next technology wave? Satoshi nailed it with the help of a bunch of, you know, cyberpunks. Um, so I watched it for 10 years, but I was really focused. I think the last decade was the mobile wave for me. And I was focused on digital transformations of, in the first era. I, I almost feel like there's, there's one segment of the mobile wave, which is uh, the digital transformation of music and books and communications and relationships and retail. And that describes the rise of YouTube and Google and Facebook and Amazon and, and Apple. And I think the second stage of the mobile wave is digital transformation of money. The, you know, digital transformation of property, digital property, digital money, digital assets. <clears throat> and ultimately, I think, I think the, the most theoretically pure, you know, metaphor here is digital energy. And uh, I, I think, of course, that second, that second uh, epic of the mobile wave is got to be 10x bigger, an order of magnitude bigger than the first epic. 
because if you ask anybody, you know, what, what's the value of having all your movies and all your photographs and all your books and all your documents on your iPhone, it's, I guess it's a decent amount. It's enough to make Apple a $2 trillion company. But then if you asked, what's the value of all your property and all your money and all your wealth? What if that was on your iPhone? And, you know, what would Apple be worth then if all the property and all the money in the world was stored on an iPhone or an Android phone? And I know it's a, it's a little bit limiting to just talk about them, but but mobile devices are so ubiquitous. And uh, I think it's inevitable that 8 billion people on the planet will all have at least one mobile device and it'll be the primary device they use to manipulate software. And what could be more powerful software than, than software that moves energy or property or money so on basically, a mobile network? So your worlds collided then. Your, your mobile world with your digital world smashed together. Is that fair to say? I think so. Awesome. So when when did when did the penny drop for you for Bitcoin to invest? And I know you 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 know an awful lot about finance and economics and bonds and treasuries and everything else. But when was the like the aha moment when the penny dropped? I think it's um, March of twenty twenty. Yeah. I if you look at. Um, the thing that's so difficult to grasp about Bitcoin as a digital transformation is, is it's, it's a, a complete paradigm shift in your view of money, property, and energy. And, and uh, you know, when, when you have something which totally transforms your world, it takes a while to give up the old world. So, just about every company on earth has a balance sheet and every fam, you know, a conventional family, a conventional company, a conservatively run organization runs on a balance sheet of cash and credit. Most central banks have cash and credit. A long time ago, people had some gold on their balance sheet, but gold, you probably peaked 1914 and uh, it disappeared. And then what you saw was companies running treasuries with cash and a lot of credit and the credit is short term sovereign debt or other high you know triple a rated credit instruments and uh, and the way you ran a business was you're either a finance company a wall street company and you and you can't really invest in cash maybe you invest in credit fixed income you're either credit or you're or you invest in equity and then if you're an operating company, like uh, a software company, you hold your treasury in cash and short dated sovereign debt. And that's just the way it was for 30, 40 years. And you were doing and that for nearly 30 years yourself within MicroStrategy. That's how we ran our company. But through the decade from 2010 to 2020, it got harder and harder for us to, to grow the company. And we were generating a lot of cash, but somehow the stock got mired. And, and you know, if you have a bunch of cash and it's generating 5% interest, and someone told you the inflation rate was 2%, you might think that sort of you're getting ahead. But when, when interest rates went to 0%, I think the first shoe to drop was interest rates are zero, or that's not good. The second, the second uh, knock was they're gonna stay at zero for four years. Okay, there's no hope of generating interest on cash and credit. Well, that caused me to stop and say, well, how bad is it? Okay, well, the how about it, how bad is it depends upon your definition of inflation. So I believe there's two inflation rates. There's an inflation rate if you want to be poor, or there's an inflation rate if you want to be rich. And the inflation rate if you want to be poor is the CPI or PCE. It's like it's like a market basket of goods and services that don't include the highly volatile energy and food, and they don't include housing, and they don't include college education, and they don't include stocks and bonds and early retirement and things like, and art. So that inflation rate is preached so often that I think the entire population just kind of internalized and says, okay, I guess inflation is less than 2% interest is 0%, I get a negative real yield of minus 2%, I have 35 years, I lose half my money. Well, I mean, if you believe that, then 
then of course it's a bad thing, but it's not a it's not a horrific thing. But I, I think sometime at, sometime after the interest rates pegged at zero, I started thinking about inflation, and I, I saw inflation from the point of view of a CEO. If half your market cap was cash, and you went to an investor, the investor would have said, "Hey, look, um, we got twenty five percent return last year on the S and P five hundred. You're getting zero percent return." that's a 25% cost of capital. You're burning, if you have a billion dollars, you're burning $250 million in 12 months. You're burning $20 million a month. Okay, so give it back to us. So, that, so the institutional investor would say to the CEO, you know, you're irresponsible to hold a balance sheet of cash and credit, give us the money back. Okay, so now you're caught between a rock and a hard place. You're either gonna give the money back and be decapitalized, or you have to invest it in something that's going to go up 24% a year. Now, and, and that takes you down this rabbit hole. It turns out if you're an operating company and you want to invest in something that's going to go up 24% a year, uh, you, and you buy a package of securities, you run into the SEC 40 Act. And the SEC 40 Act caps you out at 40% of your assets. So if you had a billion dollars in assets, you couldn't hold more than $400 million worth of S&P indexes or companies. Okay, so what do you do with the other $600 million? Exactly. So, so now, now that you're here, and again, we've got a lot of MicroStrategy shareholders in the office, and you have, <laughs> last, last calculation was over $7 billion in Bitcoin, uh, which at one stage, I think yesterday, the day before, that nearly exceeded the market cap of MicroStrategy, which means it's a, MicroStrategy is trading at a big discount. But what do you see as your single biggest concern or risk for Bitcoin, if anything? Like what really keeps you awake, awake at night now that you're, you've got such a basket of Bitcoin, which we'll talk about in a minute as to what that means in terms of global share of Bitcoin. But by my calculations, you own now more than 1% of all Bitcoin on earth. I think uh, Bitcoin's crossed the event horizon, so it's going to be successful. Um, and uh, I think that in the near term, I mean, the only mistake you can make is get levered 20 to one long with a forced liquidation on volatility, right? Yeah. If you, if you have some kind of extremely levered position and you could be forced liquidated, maybe you have a problem. But if you have uh, permanent capital, then the real question is just at what rate is it going to move up and what kind of volatility will we have? I think that um, the major test, the major test were, it, it, the growth was accelerated by March, 2020 in the COVID pandemic response. I, I feel like that, that combined with, if you look at the Federal Reserve, they went from inflating the money supply at 7% a year to inflating the money supply at 21% a year. So, if we, when we went from 7% monetary inflation to 21% monetary inflation in the Western world, that was like pouring gasoline on the fire, right? And then I think that the election, if you recall, I think Bitcoin uh, on November, it was trading 13,000, it was trading in the teens. The election was a big event and the, the incoming administration, I think, A, it, it it, it, uh, it created some clarity about what will happen in our monetary policy over the next four years, maybe the next eight years. Yeah. But B, uh, it, it brought in a set of regulators that are fairly progressive. And, and uh, you know, Gary Gensler taught the class at MIT. Yep. So he spent three years studying this. And if you, if you parse all the, um, all the testimony of uh, Janet Yellen and Gary Gensler, your conclusion is um, that election brought in a progressive set of regulators that are that are uh, that view Satoshi's innovation as real, and that think that Bitcoin is a key uh, a key platform upon which to build a 21st century economy. And then the third the third maturing event is the China crackdown. Because the, the major FUD was, well, China controls the majority of the hash rate, and maybe this is a Chinese thing. And, and since China and the US are kind of at odds over geopolitical agendas, then do we trust it? 
And the, the Chinese, if they control 50% or more of the mining industry, that was a $20 billion a year industry. They had half of it and it was doubling every year. And they unilaterally exited the entire market, which meant that all the mining rigs got shipped to the West. Or um, the beneficiaries <laughs> were well-capitalized North American Bitcoin miners. Uh, all the Chinese holders dumped their Bitcoin you know, we picked up $500 million of Bitcoin in the mid 30s, another $450 million of Bitcoin in the mid 40s. I would have been buying that stuff at 75,000, 85,000, et cetera. So the way I look at it is, yeah, it was about a billion dollar windfall, half a billion to a billion dollar windfall just for our company. It was a mega windfall, a $10 billion X, 20, 50, $100 billion windfall for Bitcoin miners in North America. It's a trillion dollar geopolitical mistake for China. They won't figure it out just how bad it is for about five years. But as we look back at the end of the decade and you calculate that, it'll be big. But now back to your issue. So what's the threat to Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin survived the pandemic. It institutionalized. When MicroStrategy bought Bitcoin, there were no publicly, com publicly traded companies holding it. Now you have Square and Tesla and Marathon and MicroStrategy and 24 other companies and 12 public Bitcoin miners and ETFs. Okay, so it institutionalized, it nationalized, it, it westernized, mm -hmm. right? You have a world of 6 billion people relying upon the Western technology stack, which is the, which is the English language, the US currency, Western law, Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Bitcoin, yeah. Twitter. And then you have the Eastern block, which sits on the Chinese language, the CNY, and the stack of Chinese technology companies and the like. And you, you can see that power dynamic. And it was very important that Bitcoin slide in as the monetary protocol for the West and not be deemed as the monetary protocol for the East. Yeah, that's funny because I always have a theory that, you know, it, it, nearly leaning into things like possible black swan events, I believe that if there is a World War III, heaven forbid there is, but if there is, it's gonna be digital in nature. And there's gonna be three underpinnings of that World War III, three currencies. There's gonna be the dollar, reserve currency of the world. It's gonna be the digital one. And then Bitcoin. So how have you ever thought about the geopolitical nature of how this could all shake out with these underpinnings and uh, I, weaving in a black swan potential? I think that, uh, that Bitcoin is like that universal digital property, right? And I do agree. If you look at the if you look at the future of the world and, the, and how the mobile wave plays out, after we finish uploading our photos and our relationships and our documents and our books and our videos and our whatevers to our phones, we upload our money and you'll have 8 billion people on the planet and you'll have 8 billion digital wallets and they'll be sitting on Android and iOS and maybe there'll be, you know, the Chinese, the, you know, a Chinese operating system and that digital wallet will hold a mixture of currencies and assets and and or you can call them currencies and properties if you wish but the currents the strongest currency with the us dollar and then the cny and then the, and and then you'll have you'll have maybe a dozen two dozen the yen the euro you know if you have a strong government Wherever there's a strong governmental influence, they will dictate a currency, which will be the medium of exchange because you're going to use it to pay your taxes and it'll be the stable coin, if you will. And the Chinese have shown they have the power to endorse the CNY and the US has the power to drive USD. Um, the weak currencies, there are 66 of them are already gone. Yeah. Out of, well, there are 190 countries in the world, 66 are dollarized, 66. And so there's another 66 that will probably dollarize maybe there'll be 10 that will go CNY, right? And then you'll see two dozen. You know, I mean, I think the Japanese will keep their yen. I mean, I think the Europeans will keep their Euro. I mean, if the European Union breaks up, then the Euro collapses and then they'll dollarize, and you right? Bank, and then you'll Bank see- Bank of England is an outlier then as well. I don't know what'll yeah. happen to those guys. 
<laughs> and you know, Venezuela, they've already lost. I mean, the, no one takes the Bolivar seriously. So I, imagine you live in Argentina, you know, you, you've got like the peso for when the government says you got to pay it. You've got the dollar for when you want to buy anything internationally. And then you've got the Bitcoin. And, and if I was smart, I would have one month of, of expenses in the strongest currency, one day of expenses in the weakest currency, and the rest of my life, my life savings in the asset. And Bitcoin is the strongest asset. Now, there may be other assets. Maybe they'll tokenize the S&P index, or they'll tokenize you know, French stock exchange companies, or they'll tokenize other forms of property. But I think what's pretty clear is for the 6 billion people in the Western world, the dollar will rise to the top as the medium of exchange and the, and the Bitcoin will rise to the top as the store of value. And that's, it's a logical stable point because you can trade dollars with anybody in the world. Everybody's built dollars into their retail systems and there's no taxable event, right? So there's no, there's no tax issue of sending you, know, sending you money or receiving money from you. I think, and also dollars are, are de depreciating at 15, 20% a year, right? And we can debate whether it'll go to back to 7% or it'll stay at 15 or 20 or 25, who knows? But, but dollars are losing value at one to 2% a month. Bitcoin's accreting in value and pesos are losing value at three or 4% a month. The news today about Turkish lira, it's, you know, it's collapsing. It certainly double the rate of the dollar. And the Bolivar is collapsing at 4%, 5% a month. Have you thought about the conversion of, you know, from the petrodollar to what I call the petro Bitcoin, if there is such a thing? Uh, like if you look at what Iran is doing, what Russia wants to do, get off the dollar, et cetera, do you believe there will be a movement towards denominating energy in Bitcoin or some other type of crypto or CBDC down the line? Uh, it's interesting subject. I mean, I, I feel like, I mean, there's a, it's back to this general idea of, well, are you going to sell Teslas for Bitcoin or not? Are you going to sell whatever you sell for Bitcoin? It, it's, it captures the imagination of a lot of people. And from a marketing point of view, it generates a lot of sparks and excitement. But it seems to me like a better idea would be, instead of trying to sell you a barrel of oil for Bitcoin, a better idea would be take all my money and buy Bitcoin, <laughs> like convert your entire balance sheet to Bitcoin, right? For, you know, if you have $50 billion and it's, and it's sitting in dollars and sovereign debt, I think the bigger idea will be what happens when I take $100 billion of debt credit instruments and I sell it for dollars and then I take the dollars and I swap them for Bitcoin and I put $100 billion of Bitcoin on my balance sheet. So I think it's, it's, it's pretty clear that Bitcoin is the universal monetary standard. Of that, it's the universal store of value. But the issue is not really whether people trade in dollars. The issue is how long do you hold the dollars? Mm -hmm. Right? If, if, if you sell me, if you're going to sell me something for a million dollars and I give you a million dollars and you convert the million dollars into Bitcoin, into 20 Bitcoin one minute later, then that was smart. And if you held a million dollars, that was stupid. And if you held a million dollars and invested in, in debt yielding 3% interest while the purchasing power of the dollar is losing 20% a year and you're minus 17% and you held that for a decade, that was unwise, like, yeah, right? Like but the real question is how do you manage your treasury? Everybody has the ability to manage their treasury and swap it into hard assets if they wish to do so. I think in, in the next decade, it seems pretty clear like, like, why, why fight the Fed? And, like if I was in China, I would be buying and selling and seeing why. I'm not going to lay down in front of that tank. I'm, yeah, I'm exactly. going to sell in that local currency. And then my issue is I'm going to want to save in the highest form of property. And if I'm, in, if I'm dealing in the Western world, the path of least resistance that results in the best, the best outcome is as long as there is a functional government in your mercantile sphere of influence, you should trade in the currency of the functional government. 
Yeah. If the entire government of Zimbabwe collapses, I trade in dollars. And if, and if no one takes dollars anymore, then I'll trade in sats. Excellent. But I, I don't... I don't think we're getting there this decade, right? So, yeah. so like anything could happen 20, 30, 40, 50 years out. But I kind of feel like as long as there are governmental entities, they're going to create their own uh, currencies. And, you know, if when the Bolivar collapses, they'll create the new Bolivar. Exactly. When the peso collapses, they'll create the new peso. And at some point, people in, in the country will fight between, do I want the peso or the US dollar? And I, I, I don't, a lot of times people in the Bitcoin world feel like they need to wade into that. I don't think we need to. I think we can just, we're getting distracted by the question of whether we should champion the peso, the boulevard or the dollar in, in Latin America. I think that the bigger question is, how do I have 100% of my balance sheet in an asset that's appreciating? Micro strategy, by the way, is, 500% of our balance sheet is in an asset that's appreciating, right? We started with 500 million in, in equity, and now we have 7 billion in assets, right? So like, it's not like 5%, it's like 100%. Well, maybe it's 200%. If you're a wealthy person, the strategy would be, the strategy would be to borrow a billion dollars, buy $1.1 billion, worth of property, put up a hundred million in equity. And, and in essence, you have 1000% of your balance sheet in property, and then hope that the money supply expands 10% a year, because if it expands 10% a year, you're going to make a hundred million a year in investment income. And in 10 years, you'll have about $2.4 billion in property, $1 billion in debt with accrued interest at three, four, 5% interest. And then you'll refinance the entire building and take out $500 million at 3% interest tax-free, right? So it's a property development strategy, right? That, and anybody can do it anywhere. Well, I've got a model I'm working on actually that looks at forecasting the money supply expansion and the debasement of the currency and the future value of things like Bitcoin versus real estate, et cetera. And I'll share it with you because I know that is near and dear to your heart, but switching gears for a second, getting back to Satoshi's, and why we are talking together is I got your attention. I am fascinated by supply. I fell in love with Bitcoin in 2017 because of its completely scant, scarce supply. And not only that, but the fact what really fascinated me was the fact that it was being lost. And, and in my community, I am on the receiving end of an email at least once or twice a week where people lose their seat phrase, where they ship Bitcoin to the wrong wallet, lose it forever, or you know, a million different reasons. And I'm not going to go into those as well. But I do want to talk about supply and what you think of this. Everybody talks about 21 million Bitcoin. I have it on good account and authority, and I've been studying these numbers for over a, for years now. I have a detailed list of all the coins that I we know of that are lost. And we have companies like New York Times and Fortune Magazine that estimate between 3.7 million and 4 million are definitely lost. There's the Satoshi lockup of 1.04 million. There's people, you know, tragic situations like Mirso Popescu, who drowned with 125,000 Bitcoin instead, which is very equivalent to how much MicroStrategy hold. So you know the value of that. So the total lost to date or irretrievable or gone forever is say 4.865 million Bitcoin. The mine to date is 18.85, call it. So the net balance is just shy of 14 million. But the real tragedy is this. Now, a lot of people believe, like Kane Research believe, 4% of Bitcoin are lost per year. I believe that's very possible, but I believe it's going to go down over time. So using the Kane digital research number of 4% loss per year, we could fall down by the year 2048. That's as far as I could go out to fit on the screen, but it goes out to 2140 if anybody's interested in seeing this. We could have less than, say, 7 million Bitcoins in supply 20, 30 years from now. Now, if we assume just 1% loss per annum, and you know, when you, when you see people going into supermarkets and they're buying Bitcoin from an ATM, they got a piece of paper, you know, you know a lot's going to be lost. You know, people that are stricken by illness or car accidents or fall off a skateboard or a windsurfer or, you know, whatever the circumstance they lose it too. Um, so just assuming the 1% loss, that would take us down to about 12 and a half million. So my theory is we will never have more than 14 million Bitcoin. 
And as a result of that, by my math as well, MicroStrategy and you and your organization, you own over 1% of all Bitcoin. Now, my big question is, first of all, do you believe in that? And second of all, do you believe other treasuries are a little bit scared off because, you know, Mr. Saylor went in there and he bought all the toys? We don't want to play that game. Or do you think they don't care? Or do you think there's enough supply for everybody? Well, um, so I'm, in, I, I'm uh, intrigued by your analysis. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest question mark is that, and I buy into everything, every line item there, the 3.7 million lost coins, right? That, that if it doesn't include Satoshi, right? Then just getting your hand around, is that 3.7 or 2.7 would be my big question. I, don't, I haven't studied that. But I'm persuaded that you're right. Uh, you know, within the, within the error, uh, within the margin of error, and um, we know the lot are lost. So it's just really just a question of is that 3.7 million the number that's lost? I agree, it's a deflationary currency, and I I expect it. It's inevitable that more will be lost. It's occurred to me, by the way, that the ultimate act of charity is to die with your private keys <laughs> and lose them. Like if, if you're asking the question, how could I make a charitable contribution to the human race in a fair, responsible fashion such that the money would be put to good use? You know, if, if you believe the market is smarter than any individual, and if you, if you believe in the natural order of things, and if you really believe in Bitcoin, then it's likely that the sum entirety of the world and all Bitcoiners are probably smarter about using the world's resources than you will be in your will. So yes. if you simply died and buried your keys, you know, either accidentally or just inevitably, then you'd be making a contribution to everybody else in the entire network pro rata pretty fairly. And then they would have the benefit of that economic energy to do whatever they felt was the appropriate thing for the good of the human race going forward. So I, I'm fine with it. I, I agree. It doesn't really matter to the success of Bitcoin, whether we terminate at 12 million or 13 million or 11 million, right? Because it's, it's pretty divisible and, and it'll be infinitely divisible on the layer two on the lightning network. So, mm -hmm. so um, we're, what really matters is that it be deflationary and not inflationary and, and no one be able to meddle with it. Um, yeah, so the, the implication, the other implication is just uh, we all should buy Bitcoin, right? Exactly. And I have another model you that should buy says, Bitcoin. Yeah, that no more than 350,000 people on earth will never have more than one whole Bitcoin. And that is also deflationary. Over time, that will actually reduce down as, you know, the George Soros's of the world and the Michael Saylor's of the world start jumping into the fray. Well, what you, was your second question? The second part of your question? Uh, I would do, the second question was regarding other treasuries. Do they oh, yeah. get why, scared off why? if you if you've bought all yeah. the toys? You know. No, I, I actually think that we started a stampede of people putting it into their treasury. There, you couldn't have found a publicly traded company with five million dollars of Bitcoin in August of 2020. Yeah, you couldn't have found one. Yep. And if you look at what's going on right now, you know, there's got to be three dozen or more by the end of this year. And you've gone from less than 5 million, like one or 2 million on corporate treasuries. And this is publicly traded companies, not all companies. Hmm. You've gone from a couple of million on corporate treasuries, right? To, to 15 billion, to, to many, many, many billions. Um, the thing that's, uh, and, you know, Coinbase just said they had like 9,000 institutional accounts. And I talk to private companies all the time. I know lots of private companies that are getting into it. Um, I, I know if a we plumber that, who, who has Bitcoin on his balance sheet, three employees. <laughs> Think okay. about that. So there's a lot out there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, look, I think in March, if you'd asked me in February of 2020, what I thought about Bitcoin and what I put it on my balance sheet, 
I would have said I wouldn't even buy it as a private investor, much less as a public fiduciary, right? I mean, and I wouldn't be sure, you know, I'd be like, well, isn't that one of 10,000 cryptos and people are all trading? So that's where it was with me because I didn't have a need to focus on it. You know, it's you don't need to embrace the idea of a paradigm shift in in property or energy or money or currency. You don't need to question basic deep seated values in the absence of a war. Right. There's two ways that people change. One is they die and the other is there's a war. Hmm. Right. And that paradigm shift. There are two things that I didn't really buy into. One is the digital transformation of my operations like not deeply. For example, I would have fired people that did not show up to the office in, in February of 2020. But by April of 2020, nobody could show up to the office and we Zoomed everywhere. And so in a matter of weeks, we went through a decade transformation in our thinking about digital marketing, digital sales, digital operations, et cetera. And, and I feel like we had the same jarring shift with our balance sheet. In February, my view was, oh, well, I guess we'll get two, 3% interest on our money and we'll, we'll be conservative. And the inflation rate is two or 3%. And you know, Wall Street doesn't maybe understand it, but I'll, maybe I'll buy back some stock, okay? And by April, my view, world view was the, the nominal yield is zero. The inflation rate is minus 20%. I'm going to lose $300 million in the next 36 months if I don't do something. And there's no hope if I continue with the traditional strategy and I have to take a risk. And so I, I think that that was, a, that was a jarring thing. And that shook everybody out of their slumber. And now from that point, Look, James, I wanted to buy Bitcoin personally, desperately. I wanted to buy as much as I could. It took me 12 weeks to get the account and the KYC to do it. 12 weeks from the point that I desperately wanted to do it. This is an individual. And you're very biting your nails, losing time, afraid it would all be sold out. Right? Yeah, 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 like anxiety induced, right? And I went and I bought huge amounts at like $9,500 a coin. And then from a corporate point of view, well, it's another three months because yeah. companies have all sorts of other, you know, corporate governance issues, the accounting opinion, the legal opinions, the, the board opinion, the shareholder relations issues. So it's six months if you're in a raging hurry. And for me, it was important because more than like half the market cap of the company was cash. Okay. There aren't many publicly traded companies where half their market cap is cash. I and remember. so I was sensitive to it. And I had sort of, when my stock got to $70 a share, right? Or we're trading $120 a share and we've got $60 a share in cash and you're trading a one times revenue. You're thinking I've been forsaken, right? There's not much downside from here. There's only upside. I should do something. So I, I think that, um, that the first jolt came March 2020. And we started in April, April sorry, in August of, of 2020, we were the first company to put that $250 million buy on the wire. So call that the beginning of year one of, of major corporate institutional adoption. Now, what's holding people back? Uh, a couple of things. As be. <laughs> one is, yeah. yeah, one is gap accounting. And I mean, the number one impediment to a company buying large sums of Bitcoin would be indefinite intangible accounting. Because if I buy a billion and it gets cut in half for a day, and then it goes up by a factor of 20, under gap accounting, I would show a $500 million operating loss and $500 million on my balance sheet. But under, under fair value accounting, I would show a $9 billion investment gain and I would show 10 billion on my balance sheet. So people talk about volatility being a problem, but you've got different types of volatility. You've got, you've got fair value or economic volatility, and then you've got accounting or optical volatility. The optical volatility of the accounting is much more pernicious 
to a public company with a pristine gap PL and balance sheet and in and, 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 and an institutional environment where people judge you based upon your beauty, like based upon your conventional, conventional behavior. I'm gonna put, uh, put report out and I'm gonna tell everyone that I generated $8 a share in earnings and they go blank, okay, that's good. Or I'm gonna print a report saying, I actually lost $16 and I had a $500 million operating loss and my operating business has lost money for the first time in 20 years. But by the way, we just made billions. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so funny. There was a, a similar corollary. Um, if you were looking for financing for real estate, six months ago within a traditional bank, you could have millions in Bitcoin. They see it as zero. <laughs> but I, I'm really concerned about time. And I, I think I've got about eight more questions to get through, if that's correct. We still have about eight minutes left. I, I have plenty of time. Maybe okay. We well, I, I did, well so maybe I, you can't. There, there, there's a, oh, I can, of course. I okay. can stay here well, all let's day. Just get through your, let's go through your questions. Okay. I, I, well, two of them are kind of related to what you spoke about being a fiduciary. One is, do you see any regulator risk of being a quasi ETF in nature? And related to that kind of two-part question is, I always describe microstrategy being more powerful than an ETF because you can play what I call financial jujitsu. You've got so many options to raise money, issue shares, borrow against your holdings, et cetera, to buy more. ETFs can't do that. So I see you as a more powerful function of an ETF. And I'm interesting, number one, uh, Gensler believes in Bitcoin. He's a good person to have in your camp. I don't see much regulatory risk, but do you believe there could be based on the sheer amount of Bitcoin that you hold? And second of all, um, the second part, which uh, I completely forget on, uh, your jujitsu capabilities to raise money, right. be more powerful than an ETF. So we're, we're not an ETF, we're not an ETP, we're an operating company. And it's very black and white. Uh, an ETF is a, you know, an SEC 40 Act company that holds securities. So you would have to, and, and a, like a future, a derivative is a security. And if they have net inflows of $500 million, they have to increase their securities exposure by the $500 million. If they have net outflows, they have to decrease their exposure, right? So they're a finance company. An ETP is also, is, is also a finance company, but there they're trading in property, right? So if they have five, and so if you're holding gold, pro property commodities, gold, pork bellies, Bitcoin is property then if they had inflows, they would increase their exposure. If they had outflows, they would reduce their exposure. We're an operating company. We have a software business that generates cash flow. We generate revenue. We don't own securities. We're not owning the securities. We're owning property. And I, I could go and buy a billion dollars worth of land in Vegas. I could go and buy a billion dollars worth of oil drilling rights or oil. I could buy a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. It doesn't make me an ETF or an ETP. It makes me an, a company that happens to own a lot of property and I can do it with or without leverage. So our business, so that's crystal clear. I mean, there's not, uh, there's, uh, and the point is we're never going to have uh, a, a bunch of people buy a billion dollars extra of our stock and go and buy the Bitcoin with that stock because we're not we're not uh, we're not balancing our asset positions every day based upon the net inflows and outflows. What it means is we can't we're a different entity. That if you're going to look at microstrategy, you have to ask the question: Well, how much cash flow will we generate? Will we what will we do with the cash flow? Right. So. If we're a company generating cash flow and we buy Bitcoin with it, then we're like a synthetic miner, right? A, miner, a fiat miner. Miners generate Bitcoin every year based upon their mining operations. We generate Bitcoin every year based upon our software operations. There's really no difference between, between um, buying 5,000 Bitcoin with cash from software and mining 5,000 Bitcoin with mining equipment there's still 5,000 Bitcoin, we, you know, we got there a different way. Then the question is, do you keep the 5,000 Bitcoin or do you sell it, right? So, so we're a leveraged long Bitcoin play, right? We, uh, we took our existing cash, we bought Bitcoin. 
that you know if you look at it look at our story james it's amusing first we actually put out a press release and we announced to the world that we we're going to we were going to go through a treasury reserve analysis and select a treasury reserve asset and we would pick something and put 250 million into it so we're the first company in the world that ever selected proactively a new treasury reserve asset and that was 250 million dollars worth then we we're the first company that did a stock buyback to buy bitcoin that was a dutch auction so we did a $250 million Dutch auction where we basically said, we'll buy your stock out or not. Yep. And, if, and, and that's the same as an equity offering. Like if you felt like the, the company's strategy is worth more than $140 a share, then you didn't tender your shares and we bought Bitcoin. But if you, did think the co if you didn't think the company's strategy is worth that, you tender your shares and you took the cash. I remember that so, distinctly. That was a genius move because there were a couple of shareholders that didn't agree with the direction. Isn't that fair to say? We had That's 16, a good way to weed them out. Well, either they didn't agree or they're just afraid, right? I mean, yep. it got anxiety. So $60 million got tendered and we bought that stock back. And the other $175 million that we had extra at the end of the day... Uh, we bought Bitcoin with. So that was the second move. Uh, the third was we issued convertible debt. So as a company, we have the ability uh, to issue convertible debt, which is, you know, which is a way of harvesting the volatility of the equity markets and the volatility of the options markets and the equity opportunity and the forward expectation in order to get cheap capital. That was $1.7 billion and, you know, blended interest rate, 25 basis points. So effectively zero cost uh, converts. The first was struck at 398, the second one at $1,432 a share. So then we bought Bitcoin with that. Then, you know, then along the way, we were still raising cash or generating cash from the core business. And we used that to a buy quarter approximately, wasn't it? Yeah, and then if like if our employees issues if they exercise stock options, we generate we end up with cash flow from stock options, and we invest that in Bitcoin. And then finally, you know, the stock traded down and Bitcoin traded down after the China exodus, right? And we had the sixty thousand grinding down to thirty thousand. At that point, it would have been somewhat dilutive to issue a convert or to issue equity. Yep. So then we basically did a junk bond. We did a senior secured note and we paid six and an eighth percent interest. And we raised $500 million and we bought Bitcoin with that in the mid thirties. Well, then Bitcoin started to recover. Our stock recovered and we sold about $400 million worth of, uh, of stock. And we bought Bitcoin in the mid forties. And then we, we ended up with another 20 million in cash flow and I bought another chunk with a bitcoin in the mid 40s so looking forward we have um we have a lot of tools in our arsenal yeah you know one tool is to issue more converts the other tool is to generate cash flow the third tool is to is to do different types of senior secured financing and we have about six billion dollars worth of bitcoin maybe more i guess that's not pledged as collateral because the converts aren't secured. Uh, there, there's no collateral pledge against the converts. Those are unsecured notes for 1.7 billion. The $500 million of debt, uh, we said we're going to use Bitcoin, we're going to use it to buy Bitcoin, and we pledged the Bitcoin. So we bought like 13 or 14,000 Bitcoin with that, and that's pledged as collateral against the note. But the remainder of our Bitcoin, something almost 100,000 or so, I don't know, 98,000, 99,000, that's unpledged. Yep. So if, if Bitcoin's trading at north of 60,000, you've got $6 billion of collateral, you could do something with it. And, and the, the question is, what would you do with it? Well, you either borrow against it or you generate yield on it, or perhaps you can issue bonds against it, right? And these are all options. So if you look at, if you look at a, our company going forward, the real question is, what's the difference between buying $100 million of Bitcoin versus buying $100 million of an ETF versus buying $100 million worth of micro strategy? And the answer is, if you buy the Bitcoin, you own the property on a Bitcoin exchange, 
the, the banking and the, and the collateralization of Bitcoin isn't as mature. So a lot of people, probably it'd be hard to borrow money easily against the, against the naked Bitcoin property. Um, if maybe, you, maybe the impact of the futures ETF will bring about more demand for borrowing Bitcoin for the contango effect. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a couple of hedge funds that say, hey, Mr. Saylor, can you lend me 50,000 Bitcoin? I can make 13% in a month fast. I think, yeah, I think there'll yeah. be a lot of demand for that. Yeah. I think if you buy the 100 million of the ETF, you own a security, you don't own the property. Uh, having having a title of the security in some ways is a weaker property, right? Because you can't put a lien on it, you can't mortgage it, you can't as easily, you know, develop it. Um, but the advantage is it trades with your prime broker, and you can and you can pledge it as collateral in your collateral package. So most of the time, if you've got a security, you can borrow against it at like so so for plus fifty basis points, or LIBOR plus fifty, or LIBOR plus hundred. So there's a big benefit to people that deal with prime brokers to have the security, not have the property. And then microstrategy is, the issue with microstrategy is you're getting a leverage long play, right? You buy a dollar of Bitcoin and it goes to zero, you lose a dollar. If it doubles, you make a dollar. But when you buy a leverage long play, if it goes to zero, you lose a dollar. But if it doubles, you might triple your money or quadruple your money, right? So it's a different thing. And obviously, if you think the management team uh, can manage the operation in a rational fashion, you know, you're going to value the company at a premium. And if you think the management team, you know, is not very rational, you're going to value the company at a discount. And that's, that's what keeps everybody, you know, honest and, and, and keeps us focused. We have to make sure we manage the opportunity rationally. And I see that now as well. I've spent a lot of time in my life front running Wall Street because I don't see certain things. When I did my first ever arbitrage video on MicroStrategy stock saying this is a no brainer, this is synthetic long, everybody go do it. And it was, uh, it's that's how, why we're here talking today. But if you look at uh, the futures ETF, obviously it did suck a little bit of oxygen out of the room from things like GBTC and MicroStrategy. And I was talking about Bitcoin proxies when nobody even knew what they were back in 2020. Um, I think that's it's very clear that's happening right now. But if a spot ETF hit the market, do you think that would suck additional oxygen? I know everything will gravitate towards proper valuation down the line. Just right now, it's a very good arbitrage opportunity as I see for proxies like yourself. Do you see that getting worse if any spot ETF hits? Um, I think that every single time another company comes public that's a Bitcoin derivative, that's that has a relationship to Bitcoin, it's good for Bitcoin long-term and even mid-term. Um, and near-term, there's dislocations, yeah. right? Like PayPal and Square are plugged into Bitcoin system as quasi many exchanges, as is Coinbase, yeah. right? The miners are plugged into the Bitcoin system as security operators. And every time a miner comes public, hundreds of millions of dollars of capital, if not billions of dollars of capital, get locked into Bitcoin. You see people like Hut8, right? They're raising money, but they're hodling, yes, right? Yes. When a public miner raises $100 million, it's like $100 million of capital locked up in Bitcoin for the next decade. Uh, when they buy $100 million worth of equipment, that's locked up, right? So an ETF is another form of a, of a Bitcoin company, and it's a, it's a company creating an application of Bitcoin, right? The, the hardcore Bitcoiners, they don't get it. They're like, not your keys, not your coin. This is awful. Mm. But what they don't realize is in a decentralized economy, everybody gets to create their own applications on top of Bitcoin, you know, and if El Salvador wants to adopt the Bitcoin standard, then El Salvador becomes kind of a Bitcoin derivative of sort. And it, MicroStrategy stock is a Bitcoin derivative, but also MicroStrategy converts, MicroStrategy senior debt and MicroStrategy calls and put options are all Bitcoin derivatives. Exactly. Every single time another, you know, if there's 16 ETFs, it's the quant's dream, right? If you're, if you're a quantitative trader, you build your program and you go, 
wow, Bitcoin is up, but Bitcoin futures are mispriced in Singapore, but MicroStrategy is mispriced against MicroStrategy call options. Exactly. So the MicroStrategy first convert is rich and I can sell that, but yeah. I can buy the second convert. But the ETF is like trading at a discount versus MicroStrategy. So I'm going to go ahead and write a program that sells this and buys that. And of course, at that point, you have to allocate capital. Yeah. I found a way to get a guaranteed 8% a year annual yield. And then they go off to somebody on Wall Street, a George Soros, and they say, George, I got a guaranteed 8% yield, no risk. You know, um, we're not even taking a directional bet on Bitcoin, but I need you to give me a billion dollars so that I can get you $180 million and I'll take two and 20 and you'll get the others and you won't even have to worry about whether Bitcoin goes up and goes down. And George goes, well, heck, if you can do that, why don't you just take two or three billion dollars of my money? Yeah. And pretty soon there's a quant trader creating side markets in Bitcoin derivatives. And in order to do that, they have to lock up two billion dollars of Bitcoin. Yeah, they flabbergasted me how, how Wall Street can't actually value your company properly. Or even you still see analysts on Wall Street valuing Tesla at a PE of a thousand. I mean, <laughs> like it's the easiest calculation in the world to figure out the actual true value of real companies, real intrinsic value. And nobody seems to do the work. And that surprises me, but you're dead right. That's going to change as the asset class gets more mature, I believe. That's exactly you know, what's like, going to happen. You know, one of my friends was saying, we we're noting that, you know, Bitcoin's volatile, even right now it's bouncing around. And, and I said, well, you know, sometimes you think you wish it would just trade in a tight range, plus or minus 1%. But then if you look at it, you realize that that volatility it, that volatility makes it anti-fragile. And the fact that you've got the volatility bouncing around means that some really smart 27-year-old on a computer goes, I can actually lock in an arbitrage here. And they go and they raise 50 million from their friends and family. Mm -hmm. And then they do it. And then they raise billions. And, mm -hmm. and, and if it's, you want it to stay a bit volatile because you end up creating a hundred different hedge funds with 10, 20, 30, 50 billion dollars in assets. And they're all trying to close the volatility and they're feeling like geniuses because they're, they're like, ha ha, micro strategy, your stock is mispriced versus ha ha. I'm like, uh, okay, fine. Well, that means you're trading $500 million of my stock every day. And, uh, and maybe that means you're gonna put a synthetic short position on it. But that means that instead of the float being 7 million, it'll be 21 million. And that means eventually somebody's got to buy back the 21 million shares or do a collateral co call. And, and ultimately, it's good for Bitcoin. It's good for everybody. And ask yourself the question, how many 27-year-olds in Singapore are setting up hedge funds to arbitrage pricing imperfections in gold? Yeah. The answer is none. <laughs> Got you I mean, job. if you look at them, gold, silver, you know, you're not going to trade them. You're not even in the equity market. You know, you, there's not a there's not an army of people that want to raise tens of billions of dollars to arbitrage inefficiencies in Apple stock because it's just too monotonic, you know. And so um, what we've got here is is we've got more options. And if they're perfectly priced, well, I guess you got perfection. And if they're not perfectly priced, you've got optionality. And the optionality makes this the world's greatest money market. And it makes it an opportunity. And ultimately, anything that locks up more Bitcoin, right? The ETF's an application, MicroStrategy is an application, and the hedge fund person trading the ETF versus MicroStrategy is a third application. Yeah. And it's like they say, man, you could say whatever you want about me, just spell my name right. Exactly. In fact, you said something that jarred a thought in my brain. One was, uh, you are a synthetic miner. Now, I know it's very important for a corporation to stick to its knitting, and yours is going to be uh, mobile intelligence and stuff. But would MicroStrategy ever consider mining, per se? Or is that way too off, if not, not required? You know, I, I think everybody needs an earning strategy and they need a saving strategy, an operation strategy and a balance sheet strategy. If you're a dentist and you can make $300,000 a year as a dentist, then my best advice for you is, is build the biggest dental practice you can and make, make sure you convert 
your money into Bitcoin as soon as you, it hits the, the balance sheet. And if you start thinking about, if you love Bitcoin and you start thinking about ways to actually do better than just being long Bitcoin 100%, my next advice for you is sell equity in your dental practice, you know, at 10 times or 20 times revenue sell 6 million, uh, you know, sell a million, 2 million worth of equity or 6 million worth of equity and buy Bitcoin with that. And if you can, I would say, why don't you go and sell debt? Maybe you can mortgage your dental practice. If you're generating $300,000 a year in cash flow and someone wants to loan you $10 million against it, or, or say yeah, $10 million at 2% or 3% interest, then raise 10 million in debt and buy Bitcoin with that. And then you'll have Instead of three, instead of three million in Bitcoin over a decade, you'll have twenty-three million dollars in Bitcoin over a decade, and you'll have twenty million in Bitcoin in the first month. And you know, if you want to do something, stick to the knitting. The doing of something is either grow your business or leverage up your bit, capitalize your business, and then convert it to Bitcoin. That's a good idea. I don't think, you know, if you tell me you're the world's greatest dentist, I don't think you should launch a mobile app to compete with Square Cash. Yep. Exactly. I don't think you should go in, well, should I launch my own Bitcoin podcasting show, Michael? No. I think what you ought to do is be a dentist. And if you're a podcaster, I think you ought to run the world's biggest, most aggressive podcast. And you ought to, you ought to if you can sell equity and debt, have at it, mortgage the business. But, um, but don't go into a business that you don't have strategic assets in. I, I mean, I think if you're Exelon, if you're a power company, if you own nuclear reactors, if you can go and borrow money, if you can borrow money at 2% interest, you know, gold miners can borrow money at one and a half, two, three percent 3% interest. If you can raise a billion dollars at 2% interest, then yeah, you ought to go and borrow a billion dollars and buy Bitcoin because Bitcoin yields 100% interest. Yeah, excellent so, idea. I, I have, so I have, use your assets, right? Whatever yeah. your assets are, use your assets, but do not, I don't think you should go into businesses where you're the newcomer, the interloper, you don't have any assets just because you think it would be cool to be in that business. I totally agree. I've got a harebrained scheme for you. This is going to be okay. a curveball. Imagine, uh, you know, all these credit card companies are paying rewards in Bitcoin. Would MicroStrategy ever consider paying dividends in Bitcoin? I know it's your pristine asset and you never sell and everything else, but how about that to raise shareholder stock price? Yeah, I don't, I don't think you really get valued for it. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think you should ever give up any Bitcoin. I think that if you go forward... Uh, if you go forward 100 years, what's 1% of all the money in the world worth? Exactly. Yeah. And, and right, so I, don't, I don't think you really need to. And by the way, I would say I don't think it's a good idea to pay dividends at all. Like, it prove, it, for me, a company that pays dividends is a company that doesn't know what to do with its money, which means they can't execute or operate. Let's take gold miners, right? Gold miners, mm -hmm. they, oh, they mine a ton of gold. They overmine the gold. They dump the gold on the market. My first view would be don't sell the gold. But they sell the gold, driving the price of gold down. They overmine the gold and they generate a big profit, 50% margin. So now they pay income tax, corporate income tax. So first they diluted the value, the supply of the gold. They drove down the price of the gold. Then they paid a massive corporate income tax. They also ran up their operating expenses. They also moved down the marginal productivity curve. They found mines that cost $1,000 per ounce instead of $500 an ounce. So they're, they're burning up the environment, burning up energy, dumping on the price of gold, paying huge amounts of taxes, and then they dividend out, or then they pay off their debt. They pay down their debt. And so when you pay off a billion dollar note that costs you 3% interest, it's like making a loan to the bank in return for 3% interest. You're actually trading, a, you're trading what could be an asset yielding 20 or 30 or 100% in order to get paid 2%. So paying off your, your debt makes no sense. And then finally paying a dividend is what they also do. When you pay a dividend, not only did you pay the corporate income tax, not only did you actually loan money to the bank, you also forced your shareholders to pay a dividend tax on the, on the proceeds. 
you got double taxed. Yep. Okay, yeah. so so that's kind of like the behavior if you didn't believe in your business, if you thought your asset was going to zero and you wanted to be short gold, I would overmine it and I would pay double taxes in order to get the cash. And you're really going like triple long US dollar. <laughs> Triple long right. U.S. dollar. I had to. I yeah. had to. I had to uh, lower the price, my selling price, pay a corporate income tax, pay a dividend tax, so I could go triple long the U.S. dollar. And so I don't think that makes sense. I think the opposite makes sense, which is, you take all your cash flows, and you borrow as much as you can, as long as the cost of borrowing is an order of magnitude less than the use of proceeds. Excellent. There's another thing that kind of vexes me a little bit, confuses my, my head. If you look at the 130 in treasuries around the world that pay nothing, in fact, I think it's 30 trillion pay negative return. And then you start take, taking into account debasement. Do you foresee a great reset? And do you believe that great reset could be accelerated by CBDCs going forward? Uh, not with a bang, with a whimper. I don't think there's like a great reset that implies that like someday everybody comes to their senses and does something. I think there's way too much inertia in the system. I think a better, a better metaphor would be just like a you know, a persistent, you know, progressive transformation. You know, I, I think that of the 30 trillion in negative yielding debt, 20 to is that whatever the number is, 20, 30 trillion. And it depends on how you depends on how you define negative yielding debt. I would define negative yielding debt as the yield on the debt minus the monetary inflation rate. And if you define it that way, that means all credit, a hundred trillion dollars is all negative yielding. The only thing that would be yielding positive would be a junk bond paying over 15%, in my opinion, like some of the Chinese bonds now that are being issued. Only, only a junk bond yielding more than 15% in the US dollar if you were an optimist and believed that the monetary inflation rate was going to dip below 15%. But in fact, you can make the argument that the monetary inflation rate in China is much more than 15%. That's why they need capital controls, yep. right? They're printing more money than we are. Oh, yeah. Right. So Europe is so, printing more money than the Fed. And so the monetary inflation rate, the, the true inflation rate for an investor, investor inflation rate, it must be 20% in the US, Europe. It must be 30% or something in China. It must be 40% in Argentina. It must be 50% plus in a lot of the developing world. And so there isn't really any credit instrument that isn't negative yielding. The only, and, and you can see, even if you look at the S&P index, James, the S&P is up like uh, 24, 25% in a year. But if I, I've been using that as a surrogate for monetary inflation, but the truth is that's probably under estimating it. I think the monetary inflation rate is higher than the S&P yield. And the reason I think that is because if, you, if, the S, if all 500 CEOs in the S&P index were not able to issue any equity or issue any debt in the last 12 months, then the price of the S&P and the S&P index didn't change, then the price of the S&P index might be a good surrogate for the investor inflation rate. But we know that the amount of debt and the amount of equity that they have issued is substantial, which means that they have diluted that shareholder, the value of a share in the last 12 months, which means that the 24% return has, is diluted and, and the true inflation rate is maybe 28, 29 in that mm -hmm. range. It's, it's, it's in the higher 20s, I'm guessing. So... Coming back to this issue, what happens with credit? It's all negative yielding, but it's a lot of it's locked up in institutions and relationships that get reviewed once every five years, and once every three years, and once every year. And you know, there's some. You know, if I'm 75 years old and I have billions of dollars with a money manager, I might not even make a decision for the next 15 years. I might leave it that way from 75 to 90. And I might, I might creep at it very slow. So 
there and if i'm likewise if i'm a government a government it might be a change administration before they would consider our government is still holding gold right hmm. look at um i guess an interesting surrogate uh, or thing to look at would be the rate at which sovereign wealth funds or the rate at which central banks took on etfs or or s p 500 index funds or big tech into their balance sheets norway did it switzerland did it i guess um the Emiratis, right, uh, in the Middle East, they did it, right? If you would ask them, do you guys want to hold gold? They would, you know, kind of laugh at you. Yeah. But the U.S. hasn't put S&P index on their balance sheet, and that's been the store of value for the last 20 years, right? 30 years? Yeah. Certainly the last 10 years. I get, There was a period, right, where maybe sovereign debt was a store of value. I think before the great financial crisis, up until 2008, it used to be, you remember when Italian bonds yielded 6% interest? I mean, it used to be that you could get governmental bonds that yielded four, five, six, seven, eight, nine percent interest. And you could tell yourself that the inflation is 7% and they're yielding 7% yeah. and there's a store of value there. But after 2009, all those sovereign yields in Europe, they all got pegged to zero or you know one and it's pretty obvious that the money supply is expanding at seven the sovereign debt's yielding one there's no store of value anymore and every intelligent investor rotated on to the s p index or the nasdaq but you know if you look at that the only way you can theoretically hold value in an environment where the money supply is expanding at 10 percent is to grow your cash flows 20 percent so all of the gains in the S&P index or NASDAQ all come down to FANG stocks, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, That's Microsoft. Right. The top nine of the top 500 generate 80% of the return over the last five years. That's ridiculous. There is no, yeah. so another way to say it is before Bitcoin, the store of value is a big tech monopoly. Hmm. Okay. A big tech monopoly, a dominant digital network dematerializing something with a monopoly. That's the only store of value left. Credit, sovereign debt is not a store of value. Value stocks are not a store of value. Utility companies with dividend yields, they're not stores of value because they can't grow their cash flows 20% a year. Now, growing your cash flow 20% a year while the Fed prints 7% more money works for Amazon for a decade. But if the Fed prints 20% more money, you have to grow your cash flows 30, 35% a year. What kind of company can grow its cash flows 30% a year for the next five years? Other than two or three names <laughs> that we know very well. Okay. Well, that's an excellent, excellent point. I got two final questions for you. And I know your time is so precious and I'm so grateful that you spent so much time with me. But first of all, a big piece of the channel I have here is to give back to help people find financial freedom so they can make the world a better place, help support animals and children's hospital and stuff like that. But I know you have the Sailor Academy, but what do you plan to give back to society as you become one of the wealthiest people on the planet? Because I've done the numbers and I think you will be. <laughs> it's, it's a no-brainer. Ten years from now, you will be like, a, well, you know what you're going to be. Um, but what, 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 what is your greater mission in life? Well, I mean, 10 years, 20 years from now. The plan for the Sailor uh, Academy is converted into a full-fledged degree-granting university, and we're on the path to do that, and we'll continue to expand the, the range of certifications and degrees in, in every jurisdiction progressively, and that's my sole heir, right? My primary heir. So when I die, whatever I've got will go to finance that mission, and the mission is free education for everybody forever. I think that I think there will probably be a lot of need for education oh, yeah. forever for everybody. And, you know, as you know, like you can polish those courses and you can you can polish the certificates and you can improve the quality and you can translate. And in the ideal world, you'd be able to go K through Ph.D. in every subject for free. Anywhere. So and maybe uh, even spin off what I call the importance of kind of nano degrees in very specialist areas, like create a Python programmer in 12 weeks that can go earn a living for his family in Bangladesh or something like that. I think there's a huge call for that type of education, too. Yeah, our most popular courses are one of them is Python. 
Hmm. You know, we, uh, English is a second language, hmm. computer networking, C++. I mean, a lot of things you can learn online. And then we've got some short courses, like 12-hour courses, like Bitcoin for everybody. And then we've <laughs> got some, you know, pretty deep physics, electromagnetics, yeah. full semester courses, and, and lots of different areas we touch. But I mean, there's, that's a bottomless well of opportunity. Exactly. And people are always going to, they're always going to need uh, more education. So. And, and, and as the world becomes kind of more digital, and people will start moving with their feet and labor will become much more mobile. It already is. Uh, so I think that type of education will give everybody on earth a chance to get ahead, which is very admirable. Uh, I have one final fun question for you. Uh, okay. <laughs> this might be a hard one. So what question would you want to be asked that you haven't been asked before? Um, what's, what's the most important thing to teach your children? Hmm. So if I, if I kick that back to you, what's yeah. the most important thing to teach your children? I'll, t I'll tell my thoughts about education. One, I studied a lot of math, but the, you know most math, calculus, calculus of variations, linear algebra, all of the advanced mathematics, for the most part, they've all been automated. The one type of math that everybody on earth needs every day, maybe every hour of the day, is uh, practical applied statistics, right? We have, we have infinite information and I think that most people, they're not able to parse information that is statistically significant so as to construct an appropriate model. And so they get mired in inappropriate models. Right? It's like they, they just can't think flexibly enough. So I throw enough numbers at you and you think that they matter, but they don't matter. Hmm. You know, like you're playing the piano in the back of, a, of an airplane and I kick you out of the airplane and there's someone that wants to talk about the, you know, the music theory and somebody else wants to talk about how notes move through the air and vibration and sound. And somebody else wants to talk about the aerodynamics of how you're going to whip through the air as you fall. But the only, you know, model that matters, right, is like the Newton's law and 9.8 meters a second, and you're going to smack into the earth is going to kill you. And all the other things don't matter. All the other models are irrelevant. There's one thing that's relevant. And I think that all the time, I just see people fixating. I, I give you all the data on the earth, the history of all of humanity. And I ask you to pick the best stock or the best whatever, or the best strategy, but there's an asteroid going to hit the earth, going to kill everybody. And the thing that matters is the asteroid. Okay, the asteroid is going to hit the earth, right? What matters? Well, how big is it? And when will it hit the earth? And if it's going to hit the earth in 10 billion years, and if it's the size of a nickel, it doesn't matter. And if it's going to hit the earth in eight minutes, and it's the size of the moon, nothing else matters. Exactly. And I think that we have a lot of people that struggle all the time in the world whether it's buying something or selling something or communicating something or interpreting something or, or making a rational investment decision. And, and they think that applying extreme amounts of mathematics to extremely large data sets somehow give them comfort and certainty about what to do. But I just, I just all the time I see people that they come to conclusions. And I think they don't have the common sense to come in from the cold because they're extrapolating from mountains of data with the wrong model that has been rendered irrelevant by one change in circumstance. Exactly. I love that. In fact, I'm not sure if you know, but the slogan for this channel is math, money, and freedom. First of all, to use math to generate money, to buy freedom and do better. So that's the whole vision. So I'm so happy you said that at the end, but you're dead right. Some people focus on the wrong things and you see people who you know, make $200,000 a year and they're encumbered in $300,000 of student debt and they're leasing a car that they can't afford for a thousand bucks a month and they live in a house that's just beyond their means. And, you know, people just don't have the discipline to focus on the right things sometimes. So there's just so much potential out there through education and math. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> so 
Well, that's, I think, the end of the show. Um, I do have a model I'm working on that I know will be very interesting to you. So maybe we can touch base another time uh, if you ever have time, but it'll be about money supply and debasement and purchasing power and the price of Bitcoin over time and other assets. And it's just for people to really wrap their heads around where things are going to be. Because when I see people you know, buying an annuity with half a million dollars, it took them 40 years to earn half a million dollars. They buy an annuity that pays 3% that they hope that will keep them alive for the next 25 years. It's heartbreaking. This is the type of math that we need to get out there to people not to go down these wrong paths. So, so happy to hear. It sounds exciting. I'd love to see it. I'll look forward to to that next discussion. And I'm so honored to talk to you in person. I've been a huge fan for a long time, as you know, and have a great balance of the week. And thank you so much, Michael Saylor. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Bye.